Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear two students discussing projects they have to do in the final year of their course. Now look at questions one and two. I'm impressed with your plan for your final year project. I haven't made my mind up what to do yet. You should do something with music. You've got the talent. I'm not sure I've got all the skills you need for my project. You can't give up now. Just don't go for anything too ambitious. You're right. Anyway, I've got the idea for the story. It's science fiction about human beings colonising another universe. Very visual. Not much talking. There's some good software for animation. It's expensive, but I think I'll get it. It takes forever to learn how to use new computer stuff. At least it does me. We haven't got that long, remember? Just to the end of term. The software isn't a problem. It's putting everything together so the story flows, so it's clear what's going on and there's no boring bits. Yeah, that's important. Maybe you could do the music for it. I haven't a clue about that. Would that be allowed, do you think? Put our projects together? It would be a lot of fun. I'm impressed with your plan for your final year project. I haven't made my mind up what to do yet. You should do something with music. You've got the talent. I'm not sure I've got all the skills you need for my project. You can't give up now. Just don't go for anything too ambitious. You're right. Anyway, I've got the idea for the story. It's science fiction about human beings colonising another universe. Very visual. Not much talking. There's some good software for animation. It's expensive, but I think I'll get it. It takes forever to learn how to use new computer stuff. At least it does me. We haven't got that long, remember? Just to the end of term. The software isn't a problem. It's putting everything together so the story flows, so it's clear what's going on and there's no boring bits. Yeah, that's important. Maybe you could do the music for it. I haven't a clue about that. Would that be allowed, do you think? Put our projects together? It would be a lot of fun. Extract 2. You overhear a man telling a friend about an encounter with a bear during a recent trip to North America. Now look at questions 3 and 4. So what's this I've heard about you and a bear? Oh, well, I've just been traveling across the States, and one day we'd camped in a dry riverbed with a road bridge across it. Suddenly, I looked up and saw a bear ambling across the bridge. Unfortunately, a car came along, the bear got scared, and clambered over the side of the bridge, where he got stuck on a narrow ledge. Oh, no! Don't tell me any more. <laughs> well, it had a happy ending. The bear was rescued, I promise. I was there to witness it. It was amazing. I called a rescue team. For a bear? Oh, why not? So they rushed out, tranquilized the bear, and lowered him down to the ground in a net. The bridge wasn't very high. Poor old bear. He wasn't to know about cars and things. It's his habitat, after all. He was there first. They shouldn't invade his territory. Oh, the bear was completely unscathed. Once he was on the ground, he just wandered off as though nothing had happened. Not very dignified for him, though. I wish I'd been there. You never know. I might have been able to help out. Mm, well, at least he wasn't hurt. So what's this I've heard about you and a bear? Oh, well, I've just been traveling across the States, and one day we'd camped in a dry riverbed with a road bridge across it. Suddenly, I looked up and saw a bear ambling across the bridge. Unfortunately, a car came along, the bear got scared, and clambered over the side of the bridge, where he got stuck on a narrow ledge. Oh, no! Don't tell me any more. <laughs> well, it had a happy ending. The bear was rescued, I promise. I was there to witness it. It was amazing. 
I called a rescue team. For a bear? Oh, why not? So they rushed out, tranquilized the bear, and lowered him down to the ground in a net. The bridge wasn't very high. Poor old bear. He wasn't to know about cars and things. It's his habitat, after all. He was there first. They shouldn't invade his territory. Oh, the bear was completely unscathed. Once he was on the ground, he just wandered off as though nothing had happened. Not very dignified for him, though. I wish I'd been there. You never know. I might have been able to help out. Mm, well, at least he wasn't hurt. Act 3 you overhear two friends talking about buying books. Now look at questions 5 and 6. I've just been to the bookshop and bought a novel that looks great. Don't you order books online? It's so convenient, you can do it any time. Oh, that's really handy, but you can't pick up the books and look at them, can you? Hardly, but you can read reviews if you want on the website. That's true, and they're well written on the whole. When I go into this shop, though, the staff ask a few questions and then point out something I wouldn't have thought of picking up, but which usually proves to be fascinating. I'm always wary of doing that. Well, the other advantage of this place is they've just opened a cafe in the corner of the shop. I thought that was a bit pointless and they'd do better to use it for more bookshelves. As I sat there, though, I realised you flick through and get the feel of a book before you commit yourself. And you can chat in comfort with other customers who are probably people you've got something in common with. <laughs> Books. I've just been to the bookshop and bought a novel that looks great. Don't you order books online? It's so convenient, you can do it any time. Oh, that's really handy, but you can't pick up the books and look at them, can you? Hardly, but you can read reviews if you want on the website. That's true, and they're well written on the whole. When I go into this shop, though, the staff ask a few questions and then point out something I wouldn't have thought of picking up, but which usually proves to be fascinating. I'm always wary of doing that. Well, the other advantage of this place is they've just opened a cafe in the corner of the shop. I thought that was a bit pointless and they'd do better to use it for more bookshelves. As I sat there, though, I realised you flick through and get the feel of a book before you commit yourself. And you can chat in comfort with other customers who are probably people you've got something in common with. <laughs> Books. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a student called Guy Briggs giving a presentation at college about his experience of learning to surf. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi everyone, my name's Guy Briggs and I'd like to talk about what happened when I learnt to surf. Firstly, I should explain that before I tried surfing, I dabbled in lots of other sports. I was a keen skier, did lots of cycle racing and was obsessed with ice skating. And it was this sport which prepared me best for surfing, which I guess calls for some of the same skills. Now, some people are self-taught surfers, but I wanted some tuition. So I went to a local school on Beach Parade, which I'd certainly recommend. Unfortunately, it's rather inappropriately named Blue Horizon, when in fact the sea's always grey there. 
The waves aren't exactly enormous either, but the instructors were fantastic. On day one, I was keen to get into my surfing gear and start looking the part. I'd invested in a smart pair of Hawaiian board shorts, so I was disappointed to find I looked awful in the wetsuit I was told to wear instead. However, my instructor insisted the key thing initially was safety rather than appearance, although I think he was impressed with the waterproof watch I'd got myself. Anyway, he was right. Obviously, if you don't know what to look out for in the water, you're risking trouble. You know, it's easy to be dragged out to sea by things like currents, so our instructor told us about flags that warn you about these and which have to be observed. If they put one up on the beach when you're out surfing, you have to come back in. He also showed us where there were rocks out in the sea, and those areas were off limits for both bathers and surfers at all times. Then the instructor taught us all about the board itself, the shape, feel and weight of it, what he called its anatomy. I got the hang of carrying it and how to pop up onto it in five easy steps. This seemed straightforward on the beach, but more difficult out in the waves. It was great to actually get out onto the water, however. On day two, we were reminded to do warm-up exercises before we started surfing, even though we still ached from the day before. This seemed a good idea, because I'd experienced some discomfort in my knees overnight, which I didn't want to make worse. In fact, however, the second day was less tiring, and I even managed to surf into the beach. On the fourth day, I made a breakthrough in the new moves I was learning. I was able to add turns to the runs I'd already mastered. These saved me from having to jump off the board when I started going too far out to sea. They're difficult, but once you manage them, you get a real thrill. On the last day, we had a different instructor. Up till then, we'd heard all about stability, finding your centre of gravity, standing straight and looking cool. But this new bloke wanted to stress flexibility instead, saying that was the key. That way, you're less likely to hurt yourself, like pulling a muscle, and the more competent a surfer you'll be. So, all in all, I would... Now you'll hear part two again. Hi everyone, my name's Guy Briggs and I'd like to talk about what happened when I learned to surf. Firstly, I should explain that before I tried surfing, I dabbled in lots of other sports. I was a keen skier, did lots of cycle racing and was obsessed with ice skating. And it was this sport which prepared me best for surfing, which I guess calls for some of the same skills. Now, some people are self-taught surfers, but I wanted some tuition, so I went to a local school on Beach Parade, which I'd certainly recommend. Unfortunately, it's rather inappropriately named Blue Horizon, when in fact the sea's always grey there. The waves aren't exactly enormous either, but the instructors were fantastic. On day one, I was keen to get into my surfing gear and start looking the part. I'd invested in a smart pair of Hawaiian board shorts, so I was disappointed to find I looked awful in the wetsuit I was told to wear instead. However, my instructor insisted the key thing initially was safety rather than appearance, although I think he was impressed with the waterproof watch I'd got myself. Anyway, he was right. Obviously, if you don't know what to look out for in the water, you're risking trouble. You know, it's easy to be dragged out to sea by things like currents, so our instructor told us about flags that warn you about these and which have to be observed. If they put one up on the beach when you're out surfing, you have to come back in. He also showed us where there were rocks out in the sea, and those areas were off limits for both bathers and surfers at all times. Then the instructor taught us all about the board itself, the shape, feel and weight of it, what he called its anatomy. I got the hang of carrying it and how to pop up onto it in five easy steps. This seemed straightforward on the beach, but more difficult out in the waves. It was great to actually get out onto the water, however. On day two, we were reminded to do warm-up exercises before we started surfing, even though we still ached from the day before. This seemed a good idea, because I'd experienced some discomfort in my knees overnight, which I didn't want to make worse. In fact, however, the second day was less tiring, and I even managed to surf into the beach. On the fourth day, I made a breakthrough in the new moves I was learning. I was able to add turns to the runs I'd already mastered. 
These saved me from having to jump off the board when I started going too far out to sea. They're difficult, but once you manage them, you get a real thrill. On the last day, we had a different instructor. Up till then, we'd heard all about stability, finding your centre of gravity, standing straight, and looking cool. But this new bloke wanted to stress flexibility instead, saying that was the key. That way, you're less likely to hurt yourself, like pulling a muscle, and the more competent a surfer you'll be. So, all in all, I would. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear an interview with a singer-songwriter called Madeline Martin, who's talking about her life and career. For questions fifteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute to look at part three. I'm here today with singer-songwriter Madeline Martin, who's been in the music business for thirty years. Welcome, Madeline.、Mm. Your early solo albums have just been re-released, together with your first hit single, the one you made with the girl band The Diamonds, almost thirty years ago. That's right. And yet we still hear that single being played on the radio. Why has it lasted so well? Do you think? Well, I'll certainly always remember it, as the promotional video had the lowest ever budget. But strangely, we weren't even sure anyone would like it when it was first released, as the music seemed so experimental. Of course, since then, some of the girls from the band have become household names in the world of pop. But I don't think any of those factors can account for its enduring popularity. The lyrics summed up important values and feelings that people still recognise today. I think that makes it sound very modern somehow.、Mm. And the recording company encouraged you to change your name to Madeline Martin, <laughs> very different from your real name. How did that feel? Well, once I'd been given the name, I immediately started thinking of myself as Madeline. It did pose an identity problem back where I come from, though. A small, down-to-earth town, as no one locally would call me by my professional name. Anyway, over the years, I've gradually become both identities in most people's minds, and the two have somehow merged now. And recently, you've also been appearing in a successful musical. What was that experience like? Well, the offer of the part came along at just the right time. It got me back into the self-discipline of performing as a singer every night and practicing by day. I met great people, some of whom went on to appear on TV. But then, after four years, I felt I'd gone as far as I could. Musicals aren't really my thing. I prefer watching stage plays, to be honest. And I felt I needed to get back to doing what I do best, which is writing songs. And I believe one of the stars of the musical hit the newspaper headlines with reports about his behaviour during rehearsals. Well. There really was nothing to report, but I think the public's obsessed with reading these stories. When people in show business behave badly, it's immediately in all the newspapers, whereas it would go unreported in other professions. Of course, truly awful behaviour is never acceptable, but it's important to distinguish between that and someone whose apparent behaviour is actually part of their creative process. I think it's rarely due to a desire for publicity.、Hmm. And looking back over your career, are you satisfied with how it's turned out? 
Well, I've never really become that well known. Obviously, you don't have much control over your work initially. You tend to take your manager's advice, and mine was good. But at one stage, I was the backing singer for a really big and talented star who had total control over her own work. But she clearly got that by being very assertive and explosive. I realised then that if that's what it took, then I didn't have the right temperament to become a big star. I'm more internal. I tend to think it's my fault when something doesn't go well, even though I'm sure of my talent. I don't know how healthy that is, but anyway, I'm happy with what I've achieved.、Mm -hmm. But you've also written some new songs, haven't you? Tell us about those. Well, on some I've collaborated with a producer who's worked with some great singers, but I think now my work's slowly moving in a new direction, away from the pop career I had and more into world music. It's certainly more expressive of who I really am, and inevitably the lyrics are more mature now than they were when I was younger. <laughs> Thanks, Madeline. Now you'll hear part three again. I'm here today with singer-songwriter Madeline Martin, who's been in the music business for thirty years. Welcome, Madeline.、Mm. Your early solo albums have just been re-released, together with your first hit single, the one you made with the girl band The Diamonds, almost thirty years ago. That's right. And yet we still hear that single being played on the radio. Why has it lasted so well? Do you think? Well, I'll certainly always remember it, as the promotional video had the lowest ever budget. But strangely, we weren't even sure anyone would like it when it was first released, as the music seemed so experimental. Of course, since then, some of the girls from the band have become household names in the world of pop. But I don't think any of those factors can account for its enduring popularity. The lyrics summed up important values and feelings that people still recognise today. I think that makes it sound very modern somehow.、Mm. And the recording company encouraged you to change your name to Madeline Martin, <laughs> very different from your real name. How did that feel? Well, once I'd been given the name, I immediately started thinking of myself as Madeline. It did pose an identity problem back where I come from, though. A small, down-to-earth town, as no one locally would call me by my professional name. Anyway, over the years, I've gradually become both identities in most people's minds, and the two have somehow merged now. And recently, you've also been appearing in a successful musical. What was that experience like? Well, the offer of the part came along at just the right time. It got me back into the self-discipline of performing as a singer every night and practicing by day. I met great people, some of whom went on to appear on TV. But then, after four years, I felt I'd gone as far as I could. Musicals aren't really my thing. I prefer watching stage plays, to be honest. And I felt I needed to get back to doing what I do best, which is writing songs. And I believe one of the stars of the musical hit the newspaper headlines with reports about his behaviour during rehearsals. Well. There really was nothing to report, but I think the public's obsessed with reading these stories. When people in show business behave badly, it's immediately in all the newspapers, whereas it would go unreported in other professions. Of course, truly awful behaviour is never acceptable, but it's important to distinguish between that and someone whose apparent behaviour is actually part of their creative process. I think it's rarely due to a desire for publicity.、Mm. And looking back over your career, are you satisfied with how it's turned out? Well, I've never really become that well known. Obviously, you don't have much control over your work initially. You tend to take your manager's advice, and mine was good. But at one stage, I was the backing singer for a really big and talented star who had total control over her own work. But she clearly got that by being very assertive and explosive. I realised then that if that's what it took, then I didn't have the right temperament to become a big star. I'm more internal. I tend to think it's my fault when something doesn't go well, even though I'm sure of my talent. I don't know how healthy that is, but anyway, I'm happy with what I've achieved.、Mm -hmm.
But you've also written some new songs, haven't you? Tell us about those. Well, on some I've collaborated with a producer who's worked with some great singers, but I think now my work's slowly moving in a new direction, away from the pop career I had and more into world music. It's certainly more expressive of who I really am, and inevitably the lyrics are more mature now than they were when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Madeline. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about a change they are making in their lifestyles. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H the lifestyle change each speaker is talking about. Now look at task two. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H each speaker's current feeling about their lifestyle change. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part four. Speaker 1. The kids have been no help at all, but what's new? I was shocked to see just how much junk we as a family used to throw away every week. Ten big bin bags. I thought, how am I going to cut that down to size? But now I'm digging the vegetable peelings into the garden and taking the empties to the bottle bank, on foot I should add. That's probably keeping me pretty fit. The digging could do wonders for me waistline, but I don't know how long I could keep it up, I must say. It's rather a strain. And, of course, you have to remember to do it. Speaker 2 Who knows where we'll be in a few years' time? We might even make some serious money. In just three weeks, amazing, isn't it? We've managed to get it together and even think of a name. We had our first rehearsal last week. It was quite energetic and I really enjoyed myself. The next thing is to set up some gigs. They'll have to be at weekends because we've all got full-time jobs and no plans to branch out from that. I got my licence a couple of years back, so I'll probably be the driver as well. But the other guys will be contributing in other ways, I'm sure. Speaker 3 For the last three weekends, I've been out with the countryside rangers, helping to clear footpaths and pick up rubbish. They need people to devote a bit of their spare time to it. There just aren't the funds available to pay for this sort of thing. At the end of each day, I was physically exhausted, ate a huge meal and went out like a light. Of course, I've had to give up my Saturday job at the garage, which means I'll be broke by the end of the month. Not that that'll stop me. I could ask my family for a loan. They've always supported green issues. I'm just hoping they'll be able to help me out. Speaker 4 my travel arrangements are still chaotic, especially in the mornings because bus and train times don't coordinate well on my daily commute and I always have to run to catch the early bus. Luckily, my boss is very understanding if I turn up late and hardly ever tells me off. I've had some lessons already and I hope to take my test early next year, so that'll help, especially when it comes to getting around on my own. It's a painfully slow process though and I'm still finding it really hard. My instructor feels I could do better, and I'm sure he's right. I know I'll get there in the end, though. Speaker 5 Now I've enrolled on this computer course, I feel a lot better about my day job. The boss doesn't appreciate that I want something more out of life than packing biscuits forever, you know. He's really infuriating. He thinks that's all I can do. 
I told him straight. I'll be leaving this place much sooner than you think. The other girls all clapped. Well, that'll teach him. The course is really tough and we get homework and everything. So there's no time for me to do all my usual things like keeping up with my favourite bands or going running. I think I can handle it though. Now you hear part four again. Speaker one. The kids have been no help at all, but what's new? I was shocked to see just how much junk we as a family used to throw away every week. Ten big bin bags. I thought, how am I going to cut that down to size? But now I'm digging the vegetable peelings into the garden and taking the empties to the bottle bank, on foot I should add. That's probably keeping me pretty fit. The digging could do wonders for me waistline, but I don't know how long I could keep it up, I must say. It's rather a strain, and of course you have to remember to do it. Speaker 2 Who knows where we'll be in a few years' time? We might even make some serious money. In just three weeks, amazing, isn't it? We've managed to get it together and even think of a name. We had our first rehearsal last week. It was quite energetic and I really enjoyed myself. The next thing is to set up some gigs. They'll have to be at weekends because we've all got full-time jobs and no plans to branch out from that. I got my licence a couple of years back, so I'll probably be the driver as well. But the other guys will be contributing in other ways, I'm sure. Speaker 3 For the last three weekends I've been out with the countryside rangers helping to clear footpaths and pick up rubbish. They need people to devote a bit of their spare time to it. There just aren't the funds available to pay for this sort of thing. At the end of each day I was physically exhausted, ate a huge meal and went out like a light. Of course, I've had to give up my Saturday job at the garage, which means I'll be broke by the end of the month. Not that that'll stop me. I could ask my family for a loan. They've always supported green issues. I'm just hoping they'll be able to help me out. Speaker 4 my travel arrangements are still chaotic, especially in the mornings because bus and train times don't coordinate well on my daily commute and I always have to run to catch the early bus. Luckily, my boss is very understanding if I turn up late and hardly ever tells me off. I've had some lessons already and I hope to take my test early next year, so that'll help, especially when it comes to getting around on my own. It's a painfully slow process though and I'm still finding it really hard. My instructor feels I could do better, and I'm sure he's right. I know I'll get there in the end, though. Speaker 5 Now I've enrolled on this computer course, I feel a lot better about my day job. The boss doesn't appreciate that I want something more out of life than packing biscuits forever, you know. He's really infuriating. He thinks that's all I can do. I told him straight, I'll be leaving this place much sooner than you think. The other girls all clapped. Well, that'll teach him. The course is really tough and we get homework and everything. So there's no time for me to do all my usual things like keeping up with my favourite bands or going running. I think I can handle it though. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time. <laughs> 